Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to Nowy's Dive Team Report. I'm your host, Greg Martin. One of the things that we have not talked about on the Dive Team Report is the most visual of, of all the arts, and that's uh, the photography that goes behind uh, taking some of those wonderful pictures that we either bring home as keepsakes, magazines, of course. We've been uh, reading things like Skin Diver and uh, Dive Training and all those great magazines for years with those wonderful, wonderful pictures. But uh, it's the people behind the camera that uh, we haven't really talked much about. So we figured we'd go to one of the best and uh, ask some questions about uh, learning to do underwater photography. Kathy Church is joining us from her from her place way down south. How are things down south today? Oh, it's wonderful down here, Greg. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Glad to have you along. And what brought you to photography? I mean, were, were you a photographer first before you became a diver, or was it kind of all hand in hand? Talk about that. No, I was not a photographer at all. I still don't take very many pictures above water, but I wanted to be a marine biologist, and I wanted to bring back inform informative pictures about what we were seeing down there. Back in the middle 60s, people had no idea what that stuff really looked like up close. There were some photographers, but not to the detail that I needed for some of the small creatures I wanted to study. Now, small creatures, uh, my absolute favorite small creatures are nudibranchs, so I'm, I'm always on the lookout for those. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Well, the nudibranchs are the most picturesque, but I, th I enjoyed things like brachiopods, uh, tenophores, uh, some of the strange things, pycnogonids, things that most people wouldn't know anything at all about, but I find utterly fascinating. So that's what got me started. And then you just moved on from there. I mean, you, did, you, did you go out and get one of the old uh, Nikonis uh, underwater cameras, or how did you start with your cameras? Well, we started out with what's called a Calypso camera. It was the precursor to the Nikonis. And uh, we also had a Rolla Marine in a, uh, a Rolla Marine housing for a Rolly, which was one of those uh, larger film format cameras. So uh, it was uh, pretty primitive. We had to invent a lot of our own stuff. For instance, to take a light meter reading, there weren't any underwater light meters to figure out what exposure you needed. Those were in the days long before automatic cameras and long before you could see your picture right after you took it underwater, like we can with the digital cameras. So we took a little uh, handheld uh, light meter from above water and uh, stuck it in a Skippy peanut butter jar. And we even wrote a little article for our Skin Diver magazine about how you go about doing that and how you'd read it and how you secure it. And so uh, it was pretty primitive, flash bulbs and things like that. So if anybody ever asks you uh, about the Skippy peanut butter jar, I mean, now you know. Everybody knows the story now, right? Yes, indeed. I never thought I would put Skippy peanut butter and, and diving together, but I, you, know, you never know. You never know. <laughs> We had to invent the little framers that go out so that you knew how far away you were supposed to shoot. We had to do a lot of uh, original stuff. I wasn't the first. There were people doing some of that before me, but some of it we were the first to figure out. And it was, it was difficult because you could shoot for uh, all day, only be able to take 36 pictures on a roll of film. Then you have to wait a week for it to be processed. So the learning process was very, very slow compared to today. So I'm, I'm taking it that today is better than yesterday was? Today's downright simple. I can go down there with a, with a student and, and say, okay, take a picture, and then we look at it together right down there underwater. We can tell what's wrong with the picture. We can fix it. We can get excited at all of a sudden seeing that it's much prettier than we thought that subject was. I mean, that's the part that really gets me enthusiastic. I'll take a picture of something just to see what it looks like. And I'll look at it and say, wow, that turned out really nice. I'm going to do some more of that. Because underwater, otherwise, with just film, you would take a couple of pictures not having any idea whether it would look good or not. Sometimes you don't know what colors are. You don't know how the shadows from your light are going to fall. You really don't know. It's all guesswork sometimes. But now with digital, oh, I can teach them in a very short period of time, and they can take it from there because they're getting their own feedback. We don't have to measure how far away the strobe is to figure out what f-stop. We don't have to measure how far away the subject to figure out your focus. That part's all done for you automatically. So uh, now you just have to be able to hold steady, not hurt the reef, uh, find a good subject, get the proper focus. There's still a lot left for the photographer to do, but it's much more much infinitely simpler than it was back in the 60s and the 70s you know and one thing i can tell is you you just really don't care about this at all you're you're not passionate about this in any way shape or form <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I've been doing this for 50 years. You know, every time I go down, I still learn something. I still see something new. I still get all re-energized every time I'm in the water because it's always different down there. 
How many times have you ever done exactly the same dive twice? No, things have grown since you were there, or things changed, or some animal did some different behavior in front of you. It's never the same, so there's always something to be done and always a surprise. Now you're teaching these days, teaching and passing passing the information on to the next generation of photographers. When you meet somebody for the first time, what kind of advice do they do they want to know? I mean, what where do you go when you meet that first person saying, oh, I want to do this so bad? Well, that, that varies. It depends on whether or not they want to get involved with uh, doing photography or if they just want to bring back a snapshot of what they saw. I teach anything from how to get the best out of just a simple point-and-shoot setting where we can just uh, set them up with one number and one type of uh, photography and all they have to do is get out and just keep pushing the trigger. That will bring them back images. But if they want that image to be manipulated a little bit where the background might be black instead of blue, they might want a little side lighting, a little texture, then they have to learn more. But that involves more of their time and attention underwater. Some people don't want to do that. Some people just want to come back with a documentary of of what they saw. And that's fine. I'll teach any level they want. And I've got wonderful staff that do the teaching too. So we can do anything from something simple to all the way up to the most complex setting with two strobes and backlighting and and, uh, adjusting and manipulating f-stops and shutter speeds so that we can get the right ratio of sunlight and strobe light. Maybe they want to make a little pinpoint of light with some kind of a a little funnel-shaped adapter that we call it a snoot that makes just a spotlight on the subject. There's an infinite variety of things you can do, so there's no no limit to it. Is there one thing that... You can tell people with point and shoot one one thing that will give them better pictures? Well, they have to understand the one control that point and shoot cameras have, and that's an EV control. In other words, it's a plus minus on the little button, and it helps to make the picture lighter or darker. So sometimes they need to set that for a darker mode so that it won't overexpose and make everything a simple washed out blue. Point and shoot cameras bring back blue on blue type pictures. So getting close to their subject would be the next most important thing. And adding a secondary strobe to bring the color in would be the third thing. Without that big secondary strobe on that little point-and-shoot camera, they're not going to have the type of color that they think they want. So the fourth thing would be, you know, I couldn't make this a simple question, a simple answer. You know, there has to be well, more. Well, of course to not. It. Of course not. Uh, yeah. The fourth, the fourth thing would be to perhaps learn how to do the, uh, the choose the best color balance for their water conditions, because the cameras are capable of making pretty good color balance, provided they've set that camera for the highest quality. Now that's the simplest thing they could do up with any camera. Set it for the highest possible quality that that camera is capable of producing. Sometimes people put it on just a, a normal setting and then wonder why their picture's not so good. Make sure that it's on fine. Sure. And like a lot of things, I mean, the, the technology has changed so much over the years with cameras and with the software and the computer that you can go in and manipulate and do all sorts of wonderful things. The things that we didn't used to have the opportunity of doing, like you said, we used to have to wait a week to get the picture. And then if we wanted to do anything with it, we had to work from there. And you know how we adjusted uh, slide film in the early days? I would put it on a light box with a type of a magnifying glass so I could reach in from the side with a little paintbrush with about two bristles that I dipped into transparency dyes. So if I had a little bit of backscatter or I wanted to darken a place, I could sort of make a, an attempt at darkening those areas or changing the color. But that was primitive. You're dealing with this picture area, you know, the size of a postage stamp, one inch across, and you're trying to paint a little tiny spot. But it's what we had to do. Otherwise, we threw the slides out. We threw a lot of pictures away just because of, of some small error that nowadays we would fix that and make the, make the picture perfect. When I think of how many slides I've thrown away, and I always wonder, oh, I wonder if I could have saved that nowadays, just scan it and digitally adjust it and, and still have a great uh, photo, that, something I'd tossed. But that's the way it goes. We're moving forward. How about equipment? How about scuba diving equipment? Has, has that changed enough to, to help photographers out? I know I know a lot of photographers still love double hose regulators or, or something along that line. What, what about the dive well, gear? Yeah, some of them like the double hose. Uh, certainly rebreathers have added a lot, but I, I personally don't use them. 
Uh, I think I'm getting a little on the uh, elderly side, and and I don't think it's for me right now. I almost started to use them about uh, 12 years ago, and then the, the hurricane hit, so made kind of a mess of things. But um, the biggest advantage that we have nowadays are the computers that you can stay down longer. Uh, I can go down to 100 feet at the beginning of my dive, then come back up into the shallows here right offshore and stay there for another hour and a half. And the computer will clearly tell me that I'm just fine. And that, to me, has really eased the difficulty of trying to get long dives and, of course, nitrox. So you can get a much longer, more comfortable dive nowadays compared to uh, going down with what we had in the early. My earliest dive was um, we could only press the tanks to about 1,800 PSI. I had no uh, depth gauge, so I had no idea how deep we were. Uh, the guys ahead of me were way down below, I was, and I was feeling a little dizzy. And I thought, well, I'm going to have to stop here. So as they came back up to me, they had those some new expensive depth gauges, so they knew how deep they were. So they were able to tell me, oh, you're at 130 feet now. I said, oh, really? I think I'll go up with you. So, I mean, it was, I don't know how we survived those days. I really don't. It was truly the Wild West, the Wild West of the world. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely yeah. was. The only thing about scuba gear that I regret has been this big change into uh, integrated weight systems. It makes it really hard for photographers to have the right balance, not the buoyancy so much, but the balance. It puts all that weight in the front. Even if you have those back-mounted pockets, they're usually above the waist. So as soon as the photographer leans forward a little bit, it pulls him completely forward. And it makes it very difficult to stay upright, for example, when you're on a wall dive to take pictures, especially if the camera in your hands is also a little heavy. So I, I wish everybody could get back to weight belts. That would really, uh, that would really help a lot. Interesting thought. I hadn't uh, really ever ran across anybody that was wishing that, but uh, I, can, I can see your point. When I put my students in a weight belt after they've struggled and struggled with the integrated weights, I always let them struggle with them first. And they say, oh, God, I wish I had started this a uh, couple of years ago, and I wouldn't have been struggling for so long. So the, the weight belt is definitely for most, for many photographers. Some are still fine with integrated. Some have learned how to handle them and tighten them uh, around their waist tight enough to be comfortable and have it to hold better. But uh, by and large, for the beginners, the weight belt's easier. Anybody who's interested in learning more needs to visit your website, and the, the website is? KathyChurch.com, just spelled with a C, Kathy with a C, church with, of course, with a C, dot com. That's all there is to it. And, and we've got a lot of different topics on there, everything from the way we teach to what cameras we sell and rent. I only sell the types of cameras I like. I don't have to make a living selling those cameras. Uh, but I just, a lot of times people say, well, can I buy it now? And I say, yeah, this is the kind I like. And so we sell those. And I do trips. Uh, we teach all kinds of stuff. Check out kathychurch.com, and if you're interested in photography or if you're interested in learning more about photography, I know a lot of photographers out there that are good photographers, but they could be better photographers with a little bit of work. Uh, be sure and connect with uh, Kathy, and uh, I'm sure that you'll become a great photographer as well. Kathy, I want to thank you so much for spending some time with us today. I appreciate that. Well, thank you, Greg. And you. If you're interested in learning a bit more about that, check out NAWI's website, NAWI.org. And as always, check out your local NAWI Dive Center and uh, learn more about photography and underwater photography. That's going to wrap it up for this episode of the NAWI Dive Team Report. I'm Greg Martin. I'll see you underwater. <laughs>